On May 23, 1993, thousands gathered in the Omni in Atlanta to witness a layered card filled with current wrestlers showing what they can do, as well as honoring the legends of the past of people to pave the way to make wrestling what it is today, or at least what it was by this point in 1993. Some of the legends even wrestled. Other legends simply talked. And a few of the legends rambled. Forever, forever in a day that's never. I'm John Rectum with the Retroview of WCW Slamboree 1993 at the Omni in Atlanta. Famed, famed building that is no longer there. I believe it was uh, demolished back in 1998. But what a rich history that that particular building had for wrestling. My fucking goodness, the memories. And this particular event created some memories. Some good and some, oh boy, that seemed like a good idea on paper. And then in execution, it was terrible. So the capacity was between 15 and 16,000 people, depending on how many seats they wanted to open up. And they had, check notes, 7,000 people. So by this point, WCW was really struggling. They were doing a little bit better <coughs> since Eric Bischoff was the executive producer and then would become the executive vice president. And he was making some changes. I believe they were just about to or had just gone to Disney MGM Studios and they were doing, you know, the marathon tapings and they were doing a little bit better. As far as like, as far as like, you know, cutting costs and everything, they were doing some good stuff. And Slamboree in, you know, in hindsight was actually a pretty cool concept because they were honoring legends and they were doing the WCW Hall of Fame and they were also featuring the current crop of talent. And the card was layered and there were some points where the crowd was really, really popping. And then there were other times where it's like, oh boy. This show was really, really fucking dragging. <clears throat> now, some 29 years after the fact, obviously some things aren't going to age all that well, but there were some pretty standout moments. So, since they honored so many legends, they honored legends and people that claim to be legends. So, it's time to honor the legends in their own way. So, they open with the legends in the ring. Apparently, they did something before the um, show went on the air. So, let's go through all of them. Luthez, obviously, honor him. Um, you know, multi-time NWA champion, a fucking legend, wrestled in multiple decades. I mean, to think the rich history of just his career alone. <clears throat> Vern Gagne, obviously, you know, the the accolades that he had before he even uh, started the AWA, fucking tremendous, even though he held on to the championship way too long and ended up leading to the demise of his company, like at AWA Super Sunday. Check out my retro view of that. Mr. Wrestling 2, of course, the crowd was chanting 2, 2, 2. And I mean, if you look Mid-South Wrestling and other territories, Mr. Wrestling 2 is a name that still holds up to this day. <clears throat> Eddie Graham um, uh, was honored by his son, Mike, who was an agent, I believe, for WCW at the time. Ole Anderson, the assassin, who I believe was Jody Hamilton. Ox Baker who had a massive mustache and huge eyebrows, and also the heart punch, and you hear the story about Ernie Ladd or whatever. Ox, the natives are getting restless. Leave with your heat. If you know, you know. Red Bastine, Lord James Blears, The Crusher, and um, Fabulous Moolah. I'll get to her here in a little bit. <coughs> Greg Gagne, Bob Geigel. Bob, I mean, Greg Gagne, obviously the son of Vern Gagne. I know, bit shocking. <sighs> Bob Geigel, who uh, ran the Central States Territory. Stu Hart, Magnum TA, Bugsy McGraw, Don Owen, who owned Portland Wrestling, and uh, Roddy Piper spoke very highly of. Dusty Rhodes, noted pedo, Grizzly Smith. Fuck Grizzly Smith. I hope he rotted away horribly in the last few years of his life, and he's burning in hell now. John Tolos, who was fresh off of being the coach on WWE television. That didn't last very long, and actually I think it was about a year and a half prior to this. <laughs> that was a really, really weird run. John Tolos actually had a pretty decent run in wrestling. Mad Dog Vachon, Johnny Valentine, Tony Schiavone, and Larry Zbysko on commentary. Max Payne does an intro on the guitar and everything. Yes, Man Mountain, the future Man Mountain rock. As you can tell, I have no idea how to play electric guitar. A bunch of wrestlers carry what looks like a weird uh, version of an Egyptian throne to the ring. As a fabulous moolah. Ice Train was one of the wrestlers, by the way. In fact, I think he was probably the strongest of them because he's just a natural moose of an athlete. But yes, the fabulous moolah. Making people do her bidding just like she, you know, terrorized a whole bunch of women in wrestling as well. And fuck the fabulous moolah. I'm glad she's dead and I hope she suffered horribly in the last few years of her life. So yeah, now we cut the Bischoff and Missy Hyatt. The lights go out just for some reason. Good, good, good work there with the production. 
And we're 10 minutes into the pay-per-view and we get to know, we, we're at like, I think we get to the first match. So good job there. <laughs> That's the thing that always bugged me about the WCW pay-per-views until a little bit later on. Like the last year, granted, I mean, they would sometimes start with action and it would get pretty fucking ridiculous, but killing that much time on pay-per-view, yes, saying it up is fine, but that's something I know, so like Springs MP97 and various others, they go six to seven minutes into a pay-per-view broadcast before they get to the first match. You could start with a hot match and then bullet point the thing and give people a chance to cool down, <laughs> but whatever. What do I know? Yeah, all those legends are in the ring and they leave because we have the first match. Two, Cole Scorpio and Marcus Alexander Bagwell, who had a sign uh, that showed the massive adulation he had from the fans. Morris, they forgot to see, that uh, Atlanta Education in 1993, boy, that system was really goddamn great. They took on Bobby Eaton and renowned uh, family destroyer Chris Benoit, who was in Zubas. And really kind of wild to see him in Zubas. Bobby Eaton, you know, late great Bobby Eaton, fucking tremendous, great tag teams, doesn't matter what you put him in, crowd was into it, Eaton was just super smooth, always great to, <coughs> always great to watch, and this match wasn't bad, Bagwell was always better than tag teams, it wasn't that he was a bad singles, but I always felt he shined better than tag teams, get in, get out, he could do his stuff, and this is also within the first couple of years of his career, him and Scorpio were actually a pretty good team, so even apparently if they didn't get along all that well, <coughs> So, <laughs> Scorpio does that, that tumbleweed leg drop that he does off the top and lands right on Benoit's face. One, two, three, and there you go. <laughs> so, that's for wearing the Zubas, goddammit. So, anyway, there you go. Fine opener. Van Hammer comes out in a singlet with no guitar. Heavy, I loved heavy metal Van Hammer when I was a kid. He wasn't a bad talent. He just was a guy that, like, once you... What, like, once you got away from the heavy metal stuff and the head banging and all that stuff and whatever, or, you know, this. Once you got away from that and the guitar stuff to shut off Pyro for some reason, doesn't seem like he'd be able to play it. He was kind of, eh. Colonel Rob Parker comes down and says, Van Hammer made a mistake putting his hands on him. And he brings a gurney out. Why would you need to bring a gurney out? Who's his opponent? It's Sid Vicious to a huge pop. <laughs> he comes out, the bell rang, powerbomb, and the bell rang. He destroyed him, did beat the shit out of him. I think Van Hammer was actually gone from the company for a bit and then came back a little bit later. But yeah, uh, Sid Vicious just destroyed him, just absolutely flattened him. Bischoff interviews Red Bastien and Bugsy McGraw. There was an attempt. I didn't understand anything Lord James Blear said, and Bugsy McGraw at least was fired up. So, we now get to a Legends match. It's uh, Dick K Murdoch, if you know, you know. Don Morocco and Jimmy Snuka. Yes, the two former rivals uh, that were <coughs> feuding at the time that Jimmy Snuka murdered and got away with the, uh, you know, the murder of Nancy Argentino. Never spent a day in jail and deserves every bit of ridicule that he gets, no matter how great he is or great he was in the ring, no matter how much he meant. Yeah, fuck Jimmy Snuka. I'm glad he's dead also. They took on Wahoo McDaniel, Blackjack Mulligan, and Jumping Jim Brunzel. It's pretty sad that Jim Brunzel probably had the most left out of anybody in this match. Um, It was fine enough. Morocco and Snuka later have words. It was weird to see Blackjack Mulligan in the ring still. We get a melee, and everybody brawls, and the match is called off. It's a no contest, and that was 10 minutes on pay-per-view. It was cool to see the Legends out there for a little bit, but in retrospect, they should have cut this by a few minutes and just gone to the finish and add a couple more minutes to another match. But whatever. Missy interviews Mad Dog, uh, Mad Dog Vachon and the assassin Jody Hamilton. Mad Dog uh, takes the mic. I wasn't done talking. Mad Dog Vachon was certainly unique. Very, very unique. <laughs> um, and there you go. The sad thing is the interviews would only get worse after this. Thunderbolt Patterson, speaking of getting worse, uh, and Brad Armstrong. He gets it was supposed to be Bullet Bob Armstrong, but Bullet Bob had a knee injury. It was or some sort of injury. He was also working a program in Smoky Mountain Wrestling at this time. So there you go. Maybe he maybe it was the program he was working and he couldn't make this shot. No idea. <laughs> they took on Baron Von Ratchke and Ivan Koloff. Sadly, Ivan Koloff was the best out of the three legends here because Von Ratchke... I want to say was 53 at this point, 52, 53. He, I mean, Rashke was never the best in the ring, but he certainly had a personality and was, and 
he was beloved by the time he, they got to the end of his career because he had been a heel for so long, people had no choice but to respect him for his longevity. And same with Ivan Koloff. Even though they were working his heels, Thunderbolt Patterson's like, oh, Brad Armstrong, you win a team with me? Okay, let's do that. This was not good. Because Thunderbolt Patterson was bloody fucking rotten in the ring. I think he's still alive. I don't actually know. <clears throat> but it was a mess. He hit the throat chop. One, two, three. I think that's the only uh, move the Thunderbolt Patterson bar to really do. So there you go. Thunderbolt Patterson and Brad Armstrong get the victory. Flair for the gold. Talk show while his non-compete was continuing. I think his non-compete was done by Beach Blast. Was the Clash of Champions or Beach Blast? I'm trying to remember. I think it might have been the Clash. Because he had his... um. <clears throat> I think it, I'm trying to remember because I'm trying to remember the timeline because I know that right after he left WCW in 1991, he signed a deal with Vince and I think it was a two year deal. So Vince let him leave on top. But since he went back to WCW, he had to make appearances, do call stuff or do talk show stuff, do interviews, <laughs> couldn't wrestle. So his, uh, you know, future wife, one of his many future wives, Fifi was the maid. I'm just going to say right now that Ric Flair is terrible when it comes to marriages. So, Triple A, Triple A, Triple A, yeah, they're going to have to call Triple A to get him out of the ring. No, uh, it's Double A, Arn Anderson. He's going to face Barry Windham later for the NWA Championship. He will win. Then Ole shows up, who looks like he literally wanted to be anywhere else other than there. So, they want to make the four horsemen whole, the horse, the holesmen, if you will. Boy, totally screwed up that pun. Who is it? And Flair does his big introductions as pretty Paul Roma. Poor Paul Roma. They put him in an unenviable position. Roma was fine in tag teams, and him and Paul Orndorff were a tremendous team. And Roma had a good look, but it didn't work. And this is when they were just throwing anybody into the goddamn horse. I mean, it was a bad idea. It didn't work for either party. And Roma and Anderson were a decent team. I mean, Anderson could work with anybody, and Roma could definitely shoulder his load in tag teams. The aforementioned one with Paul Orndorff, pretty wonderful. They were pretty damn good. Haha, -ha, ironically. But, yeah, this wasn't good. This wasn't good, and unfortunately, it kind of became a meme, and that's unfair to call Paul Roma the worst uh, <clears throat> member of the Four Horsemen, because at least as a worker... He was fine and uh, were pretty good. And actually on promos, he was fine. I know that people like Mongo and think that Mongo was a fit. Mongo was a fit outside the ring. He was not a fit inside the ring. But there we go. So Johnny Valentine joins commentary for Nick Bockwinkle with Vern Gagne versus Dory Funk Jr. with Gene Kanitsky. Bockwinkle was nearly 60 here and yet looked younger than Dory Funk Jr., who I believe was seven years younger than him. Yes. Bockwinkle was born in 1934, <clears throat> so he was 58, 59 by this point, and this is his last ever match. He had obviously completely winded down by late 87, mid-88, maybe it was mid-88, I'm trying to remember. He really, he was, was a road agent for WWE. I think he had left at some point and gone, you know, <clears throat> and been that for... Vince, when it became obvious that the AWA wasn't working all that well, but he, I think he went back like soon after because, or like within like a year and a half because of budget cuts, got budget cuts, pal. Ha <laughs> ha. But then he made some uh, occasional wrestling appearances, would become the WCW commissioner shortly after this. This is his last match. The crowd didn't care at all. It was a fine wrestling match, a good wrestling exhibition between two guys that were, of course, well past their prime, but good for what it was. Time limit draw, and the fans applaud because it's over. Yay, we don't have to watch this anymore. That's unfair to those legends, but that's how they felt. So, Bischoff's interviewing Luthez and Bob Geigel. And there we go. <laughs> and Luthez was very gracious. Bob Geigel, I don't think, had any clue where he was. So, Rick Rude and Paul Orndorff versus Dustin Rhodes and Kensuke Sasaki. Interesting to see Orndorff and Rude as a team. Dustin was feuding with Rude over the U.S. Championship, and while this wasn't great, it was fine. Rude Awakening, one, two, three. There you go. Sasaki got pinned, because of course he would, because the future Power Warrior went, or, you know, was doing some great things in New Japan with Hawk. Gordon Soley um, talks about the legends uh, that are going to be in the Hall of Fame, and he asked for a moment of silence at one point, and they and the crowd didn't listen, or couldn't hear him, or were too drunk. Or inbred. I don't really know. <laughs> but 
he mentions people that passed away that are no longer with us that they're going to honor, but they they obviously aren't here to accept. Pat O'Connor, Buddy Rogers, Andre the Giant, who had just died earlier that year. Gene Anderson, um, twitching all the way. Wilbur Snyder and Dick the Bruiser. Not Bruise the Dicker, as I keep calling him, because I'm just weird like that. And, yeah, the moment of silence didn't work. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Vern Gagne, Luthez, Mr. Wrestling 2, and Eddie Graham. Mike Graham accepts. It's very eerie if you read up on Eddie Graham and Mike Graham, how they both ended uh, their lives the same way. Very, very sad. Don't do that. Um, and this is not a knock. If you feel that you're getting to that point, reach out. There are people out there. So, um, Missy Hyde interviews John Tullos and Lord James Blears. Apparently, well, maybe, you know, it must have been somebody else besides Lord James Blears that got in interviewed. But you know what? I really don't give a shit at this point. Uh, because it was just getting to the point where I was just not caring about anything that was going on. <clears throat> because John Tolos, by the way, was... It, it, he looked weird. He almost looked younger here than he did as a coach. Huge pop for Sting, who took on the prisoner, a.k.a. the former Nails. Ah, natural light. Get it off me. Nobody gets that reference. If you do, please let me know. Nails was dog shit, and he choked him with a cord at one point. David Carradine was furiously taking notes. <laughs> and no DQ, by the way. And Sting hits a crossbody in about five minutes. One, two, three. What was the point of this match? I don't know. I'm trying to remember. I remember a bit about the TV, and I remember it being a goddamn convoluted mess. So, he announces kill time while the cage is set up. Bishop interviews the Crusher, the Crusher and Ox Baker. Was the Crusher drunk or even coherent at this point? Ox's eyebrows took over and cut the promo for him. And the Hollywood Blondes, uh, stunning Steve Austin and Brian Pillman, <coughs> took on Dos Hombres, which was Ricky Steamboat and Shane Douglas. It was actually Tom Zank, because Shane Douglas had been fired a little bit before. So how could they pull this off, you wonder? What is Dos Hombres? Uh, they were in body suits with masks, so that's how you could tell. That's how you could, like, hide the fact that it was Tom Zank, because you could tell that, one, the body type wasn't the same as Shane Douglas, and two, Zank wasn't as good. Steel cage match for the World Tag Team Championships. And the announcers kept mentioning it was Steamboat and Douglas, but it wasn't, because, again, Shane got fired before this. It took a bit to get going. It also got very sloppy at the end, and it's weird because... You know, there were three great talents in this ring and Tom Zank, who was fine, but he wasn't great. I mean, come on, he's Tom Zank. <laughs> he was called the Z-Man for a reason, because he put people to sleep anytime he talked. So the cage barely had any give. Steamboat getting the hot tag. He takes his mask off, hits a crossbody from the top of the cage. Big pop there. And then it got messy with the near falls, because we got this the near three count on the crossbody. But no, 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 it wasn't. The referee waves it off. And then a stun gun on Zink. One, two, three. At least the worst of the bunch took the pin. And there you go. That's pretty much it right there. By the way, earlier the assassin had mentioned in his promo, Hey, Dusty, I know we've had a lot of, uh, you know, issues. Let's settle it once and for all if we need to. You know, because both were about the size of rounded baked potatoes and had about the same mobility by this point. And I love Dusty. And the assassin's a hell of a goddamn talent <clears throat> and was great for wrestling. Great in the territories. Nobody wanted to see these two guys try to wrestle. Dusty mentions that, okay, Assassin, it'll never be over Assassin Anderson. Wait, no, that was Ole Anderson. Mr. Wrestling 2 also talked. And then there was Stu Hart. I am convinced that Stu Hart was from another planet whenever he talked. And he trained so many great wrestlers and the family and legendary, legendary wrestler. Honestly, a dark side of the ring on his story, his accolades alone building up to you know, the Hart Family Dungeon and whatever would be <coughs> great, but Stu was never a good talker. He sounded like a friggin' hot air balloon that was wheezing out. So, that was mean. Arn, by the way, Brett's my favorite wrestler of all time, but Stu was never a natural talker. Arn Anderson gets a pop. Barry, sort of. Barry Windham versus Arn Anderson for the NWA World Championship, and oh dear, you would have thought this would have gone great. And it would have gone great. Except... Barry was immobile by this point. He had gained weight because everybody in that family gains weight. Arn Anderson can only do so much even at this stage of his career when he had been wrestling and wrestling and doing some great stuff. Whew. Barry got uh, some color when one was bleeding like crazy. It wasn't good. 
I don't know who was supposed to be the face. <laughs> you would have thought Arn was supposed to be, but Arn was so respected. Barry, at one point, um, gets knocked down, and it goes outside the ring, and is like, I'm just going to take my title and go home. Arn had shoved the ref by this point, so there could be no count out. He uh, takes him off on the ramp and throws him back in the ring over the top rope, beats him up, shoves the referee again, but then we get a belt shot. One, two, three. So Arn shoves the ref twice, no DQ, belt shot leads to a victory. This was messy. There's nothing wrong with doing messy stuff, but they could have done this a whole lot better. No, oh, yeah, neither guy, <clears throat> neither guy was as motivated as they should have been, and on paper this should have worked. But it didn't. Davy Boy Smith versus Big Van Vader for the WCW title. Harley Race, eight-time world champion, by the way. Eight-time, because they say his last world title was in 1983. It was actually in 1984 in April, March or April, for a few days. Unrecognized by the AWA, but he... Or, the AWA. The NWA champion was unrecognized by the AWA. That makes no goddamn sense. Harley Race did win the NWA championship for a for an eighth time. <laughs> so, it was power upon power. Harley Race got involved. Vader um, nearly landed in a woman's lap uh, doing the splash on the guardrail, nearly collapsing the guardrail. Big delayed uh, suplex to a pop by British Bulldog. It got a little awkward later. Like, there were some great power moves and some great stuff, but just the near fault, everything just came out of nowhere. It was just very, very odd. <laughs> um, at one point... Um, you know, Har uh, Harley gets involved after, after, um, Bulldog had caught Vader in a power slam. And then a chair gets used by Vader. That causes a DQ. Bagwell comes down, Too Cold comes down. They get laid out. And then here's Sting to a pop. He stops Vader. And then everybody kills time. And that's the end of the pay-per-view. What a way to honor the legends right there. Including known pedo Grizzly Smith and fuck the fabulous Moolah, I'm glad she's dead. And also renowned murderer Jimmy Snuka and future renowned murderer Chris Benoit. Anyway, agree, disagree, what I said, like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Ritland. I'll see you soon.